Thanks for clicking on the video. Uh, really quick, if you are new here, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna take the Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 3D and move the camera outside of its intended boundaries in order to find unused content and explain developer techniques. If you saw the original video of the N64 version two years ago, you're gonna see a lot of similarities here, and I'm going to be using a lot of that footage to compare side by side. But still, with that said, there's a lot of decent new content here, and I recommend that you stick around to the end of the video. Two people that I need to thank really quick is Chani and Kimberly for the animation. Make sure that you check out their YouTube channel in the video description and this amazing camera tool set developed by Jasper. And he has something really special to share with you guys, so make sure you check the video description for that or wait till the end of the video so I can explain it to you. But with that said, time to fulfill a long time viewer requested episode. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time 3D, let's do it. So in general, I'm going to be doing this episode in chronological order, but I wanted to start off really strong with you here and show you something that I thought was really interesting. So you might be able to recognize this place. It's one of the grottos in Ocarina of Time, one of those places where you fall down a hole and you get a little bonus item. Well, whatever I told you this, when you take the camera outside of any grotto in Ocarina of Time, technically speaking, every grotto that is designed for this game is all stored in one map. And what you're seeing right now is where all those grottos are stored. Now, you wouldn't normally be able to see this in-game even if you could clip outside the grotto because the way that the engine typically works is that it would hide all the other grottos if you're in the designated grotto that you're supposed to be in. This is also the case for dungeons, so when you see any zoom outs in this episode for any of those, keep it in the back of your mind that there is a special exception being made so that you'd be able to see this. One of the most defining separations between Ocarina of Time 3D and its counterpart, the N64 version, is that the N64 version had a lot of 2D textured areas, whereas in the 3DS version, all those areas have full 3D modeled areas. Now surprisingly, in the N64 version, there was something really cool about that, which was that the developers left in the geometry that is 3D behind those 2D textures, and so you got to see untextured 3D modeled areas that were never meant to be seen by the player. But alternatively, the 3DS version has 3D modeled backdrops that didn't exist in the original version. And so outside the door here, you can see a low poly version of Kokiri Forest. But it honestly doesn't even end there. If we were to take a zoom out of Kokiri Forest, you'll see even more details outside of the boundaries. One of which is really surprising to me. It's the great Deku tree, and he's somewhat modeled over here. But what makes this stand out against the original version is that you can see his retinas. Now, in this low poly version of the Great Deku Tree, it's very, very easy to see those retinas, whereas when you see him in person, those retinas are there, but they're very, very well hidden behind his eyebrows, so as to not make a complete contrast to the original model. Also, this is a really cool fact that I didn't even mention in the original episode, but it is featured in both games. In the cutscene where Navi's trying to go find Link and you're in the first person perspective, there is a Deku shield above Mido's house. Now, that fact alone is really cool, but I wanted to know why this is here. And so while reaching out to a Nintendo developer is a pipe dream, it's probably never going to happen. I did reach out to someone who's doing a current project for Ocarina of Time, Melon Speedruns, who, if you didn't know, is making a 15-player online multiplayer version of Ocarina of Time. It's pretty incredible. I can't wait to play that. And he gave me a little bit of insight on the shield that I would have never known, and that is if you shot at it, it would fall off of its hanging position, meaning that this shield was likely meant to be the original spot in which you got the shield, and that you would have to have the slingshot before getting the shield. And I was assured by Melon Speedruns that this was intentionally coded by the developers. And so to summarize, what you're looking at here is a relic of an original design decision for Ocarina of Time. Now, this was pretty shocking to me. I'm gonna let you in on a little bit of a trade secret in the game industry. Whenever someone makes a first-person shooter game, typically, the only thing that exists are the things that you see right in front of your face. Everything else is either culled out or simply doesn't exist. And so when you pull the camera back, it's very often you'll see just a pair of arms and a gun. However, in Ocarina of Time 3D, there isn't a whole lot of sense being made here. Yes, there are some aspects of Link's model that are culled out, but not the most important parts, which is the head directly behind the camera that the game uses. Thankfully, it still leaves a very interesting piece of footage to show you. It's just unconventional. Also, this is what the perspective looks like with Adult Link and his hook shot. So 
so this whole section is just going to be dedicated to the kingdom of Hyrule. Uh, the Hyrule Marketplace, the Temple of Time, all the areas inside of that umbrella. And the first thing I want to start with is the Hyrule Marketplace. Now, in the original episode for the N64 version, this was the highlight moment. Once again, the developers used 2D textures to depict the marketplace, and when you took the camera outside of its intended boundaries, you got to see the entire marketplace with that green 3D geometry. But there was one major drawback to that, and that was that we couldn't explore this area with a very limited camera. Well, thankfully, in Ocarina of Time 3D, the camera is still limited to the player, but it's fully 3D modeled. And so now taking the camera anywhere we want allows us to explore the marketplace in the way it was intended to be for the very first time. Now, some of the major differences that you'll notice here is the textures for the market people that you normally can't see from the front of the face has been removed. See, in the original game, there were some really, really low quality textures for these eyes and mouths. But here in the 3DS version, it's completely gone. Also, once again, instead of a 2D texture to represent the castle off in the distance, there's 3D depth illusion being used. And the side alleys are a particular treat. You can now look at all this environment from any angle, though some aspects of this are not shown on all sides like the hanging clothes. If you try to look at it from the unintended angle, you're not going to be able to see it. And the outside of Hyrule Castle is generally the same. In the original game, there was a lot of 3D geometry used, but of course, once you got to a certain angle of the castle, you'll notice that it's not modeled on top of the roof. And the same can be said for the 3DS version as well. But the major difference is off in the distance, you can see a texture was used, whereas in this one, there's some low poly models at play. But by far, the biggest inspiration behind this entire episode is the Temple of Time, because it is fully modeled this time around. Or at least that's how it appears at first glance. Now again, in the original game, 2D texture, so there was no way to really explore the Temple of Time and kind of get an idea of what the developers intended for you to see when you're looking at it. But in Ocarina of Time 3D, I can now manipulate the camera in various angles to better immerse yourself into what this area is supposed to feel like. Though if you were to take the camera on the complete opposite side of the temple, you'll see that there's no modeling on this side. Once again, because the camera would never be angled in such a way in which you would be able to see it. So to save on resources and time, it's simply not there. And also the castle courtyard has some additional details that were not in the original game. One of which being a hallway on the inside of the building that lines along all the windows and it's all interconnected all the way to the very end of this whole segment which is pretty impressive also fun little fact that i don't even need to show here if you were to go at the castle courtyard at night the guards catch you immediately which is something you can experience on your own but fun little fact only a fraction of the castle courtyard is actually modeled when you go there at night as opposed to here where it wraps all the way around to zelda's courtyard and speaking of zelda's courtyard there's a new room used here for the mario cameo i think a lot of you know that if you shoot the slingshot at the window on the right you can hear a little Mario jingle. And in Ocarina of Time 3D, instead of showing portraits of the Mario characters, they instead set up a Mario level. And taking the camera inside the window can show you that there's a lot of environment here that the player would never get a chance to see. Meanwhile, on the opposite side, there's supposed to be a room that in the original game was in fact better set up than it is here. But something that I didn't cover in the original episode that I'm happy to cover here is what happens to the guard who throws the bomb at you. Looking at it from this angle, you can see the guard pokes himself out, throws the bomb, and then once he's out of sight, he disappears again. He's also a very special type of guard that's also used when looking through the window at Ganondorf in the same scene. What makes them special is that they're not modeled on all sides. They're only modeled in the front. Here's a viewer request that was a very long time in the making. It's a zoom out of the Lost Woods. Now, the reason why I never included the Lost Woods as a zoom out before is because when you zoom it out, there isn't really a whole lot to see. Like I mentioned earlier in the episode, on certain maps, there are rooms that decide what you see at any given time. And in the Lost Woods, once you're in that one quote unquote room, the other ones are made to be invisible. But the cool thing about this is you see those black cones and black squares on the ends of each entrance and exit. Well, the cones will always bring you to a new map, whereas the squares can simply load a new room. But that's not what you guys want to see. You want to see the entire Lost Woods in one shot. Well, once again, thanks to Jasper's help, we can make that a reality. And so with that said, here is a zoom out of what the Lost Woods would look like if all the paths were shown at once. So, I don't know if you guys are going to find this interesting, but I thought this was probably one of my favorite things about this episode. Um, in the Chamber of Sages, I was exploring around and I started to notice that when you look very closely 
you can see structures underneath the water currents. But as you might be able to notice by this footage, it's very difficult to notice that. And so once again, I enlisted the help of Jasper who, through his program, allowed me to remove the textures of the water flow. And now without anything covering it up, you can see the design patterns of all the stone structures that all the characters rest upon. Circling back, however, I noticed something that the remake took away from the original game. Now, one of the best things that was shown off in the original Ocarina of Time episode was that if you remove the texture that is supposed to cover Sheik's face, you can see that Sheik had everything from a chin, mouth, and nose that was generally hidden from the player. However, for some reason in the 3DS version, the face mask is all part of the model. And so, by taking the camera inside the face mask here, you're not going to find a face, which I found a little bit disappointing. In fact, that's not the last thing that they did to remove things that the player was never meant to see. Another great little tidbit was that in the original Ocarina of Time, you could find Gerudos inside of the Iron Knuckles. Although the helmets are never supposed to come off except for Naboru, there was fully modeled faces underneath the helmets. In the 3DS game, however, there are no heads underneath, but you can still find jewelry and skin tones that are clearly Gerudos. So if you ask me, I personally don't believe it was taken away for lore reasons. I would just have to guess that the developers were left with the choice of retexturing these heads and personally just saw no reason to do it. This whole section is going to be dedicated to bosses and mini bosses. And the first one I want to talk about is Phantom Ganon. Before you trigger the cutscene with Phantom Ganon, you'd be able to find his model hidden underneath the stage. This is something that game developers do so that they can immediately call upon the actors for whatever scene they want to use them for without having to do any sort of loading. And a lot of people on Twitter ask me how does it work exactly when he goes through the paintings. Well, it's pretty fascinating. The paintings themselves obviously have no 3D depth. What the developers had to do here was squish the geometry of Phantom Ganon so that you can't catch any 3D depth of him by looking at the scene from various angles. And then rather than move the character model through the geometry of the painting, the developers had to slowly pan the character model upwards to give the illusion as if he is running off into the distance. And when the real Phantom Ganon comes out of the paintings, the size and shape of Phantom Ganon then restores itself. And for the Fire Temple boss, there's a lot going on here. First of all, before you engage with him, you'll see that all of his geometry is also squished up, but in a kind of different way, because the upper portion and the tail end remain in their original shape, whereas most of the body is all bundled up, and you can see that it creates a really strange effect. During the boss fight, however, you know that the character goes into the ground, and when that happens, you can see that the boss coils up like a snake. In every instance in which it pops out of the ground for you to attack it, the body is completely straightened out underneath the ground, revealing to the player just how massive its length really is. Also, bonus thing that's not really a boundary break subject, but if you were to slow down and zoom in on the footage of Shadow Link and take a very close look at his shield, we can see that Shadow Link's Triforce pieces are separated from one another. In fact, the entire texture of the Hylian shield is slightly different from that of Link's. Because I got a lot of requests for it, here's what the well boss looks like from underneath the ground when it starts to spring up. Which as you can see, it's not that exciting, but I wanted to make sure all the bases were covered here. And one last example of boss storing is Twin Rova just before that fight. Although it looks like there's only one stored underneath, the sisters are in the exact same pose. And since the models are nearly identical, it only gives off the illusion of one. a whole bunch of loose ends that didn't really fall into a category but I thought they were really interesting and so I'm just gonna kind of flash through these. Shout outs to the most annoying bird in the entire series. Every time you suffer through a lengthy explanation, Capora flies off in a certain direction. And it's discovered that Gapora goes through a long flight path before ever reaching a point in which he disappears. In this one example, he almost reaches Long Long Ranch before disappearing. Many of the shopkeeps, just like in the original game, don't have legs. Which is interesting because you could have ported over the models from Majora's Mask, which at that point did have fully modeled legs for all these NPCs, but I guess they didn't want to go through the extra effort. It wouldn't even make sense because the game does a really good job of making sure you don't get to see behind the desks anyway. The well in Kakariko Village has two different stones blocking the entrance. The one when you're a child has a giant fully modeled boulder, whereas the one when you're an adult is just a texture that goes over the door frame. Here's an example of some enemies that spring from out of the ground and have unique animations that can't be seen by the player. Like for example the one that you just saw here, as well as the Deku merchants, who seem to crisscross their limbs once they're fully underneath the ground. 
it's kind of difficult to see, the Gravekeeper's image is plastered on two different things inside of his shack. One is on the poster on the wall, which is a little bit easier to see. But nearly impossible to see is the book that's on the desk here also has the same image. The logo for the game is 3D. Now I know that's not really exciting. The game is supposed to be 3D and uses 3D depth. However, the backside of this logo is fully modeled, which of course is something that the player can't see. When Darunia goes off camera during his first appearance in the Fire Temple, the truth is he never opens that boss key door. Instead, the character model just slides right through the geometry and continues onward into the void. The way that the twisted hallway works in the Forest Temple is a little more interesting than you'd think. The illusion is pulled off by twisting the entire room as Link walks down the hallway. This is evidenced by the fact that the door that Link is supposed to get through remains stationary in place, and it's not until Link gets to the end of the hallway that the entire room starts to line up to where the door is. The shark in Lake Hylia is still not a fully modeled shark, but to some people's surprise who didn't see the original episode, the shark is not a 2D texture. It is a 3D model, just not modeled on all sides. In the Spirit Temple, there's an obstacle in which the environment shifts left and right and you're expected to climb up it. Well, if you were to pan the camera all the way back, you can see that the textures extend far outside of the room itself, leaving behind this honestly kind of funny image. In Lord Jabu Jabu's belly, there's lots of rooms here that are always square, but inside of those squares houses a sack of pulsating meat with the pulsating meat being the part that you're supposed to see. And of course, this was something that was not possible in the original episode, but thanks to the fact that Ocarina of Time 3D does not do massive amounts of culling, I can finally present to you a zoom out of the haunted wasteland. And here's a gorgeous zoom out of the entirety of Hyrule Field. Anyways, while I got you here, maybe I can ask you a small favor if you uh, have the time or if you're in the mood to watch more content like this. For whatever reason, YouTube has stopped serving out my videos to people after the new episodes come out. So I'm going to have a link to the playlist at the end of this video as well as in the video description down below. If you click on that and you pick one more game to watch, uh, I think it'll help me out immensely. If not, I totally understand. Thank you so much for watching. And if you want to do a little bit of boundary breaking on your own, there is a website now that doesn't involve having to manipulate the game's software in any way, so I don't feel entirely bad about mentioning this to my audience. There is a site called noclip.website, developed by Jasper himself. Feel free to check it out, it's incredibly awesome. And feel free to share any screenshots with me on Twitter, I'd love that. And uh, once again, thank you to Chani and Kimberly for doing the animated intro. Make sure to check out their channel in the video description down below. They have a lot of great animations already made. Anyways, guys, take care.